Namaste. So continuing with Vichara Sangraham, a collection of texts on the topic of self-examination or self-inquiry. The next question is very interesting, and Ramana's reply is even more interesting. Take a look. Devotee, how do the three states of experience, the three bodies, etc., which are imaginations, appear in the self-light, which is one impartite and self-luminous? Even if they should appear, how is one to know that the self alone remains ever unmoving? And to illustrate the answer to this question, Ramana drew the following diagram in the sand. So I'll now explain each part of this diagram. The example is given on the left and the exemplified on the right column. The lamp represents the self. The door represents sleep. The doorstep represents the Mahatattva, the collection of all material elements. The inner wall is nescience, the causal body. The mirror represents egoity, the self of I am an individual. The windows are the five cognitive sense organs, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. The inner chamber represents deep sleep, sushupti, the causal body. The middle chamber represents dreams, that is, svapna, the subtle body. And the outer court represents waking consciousness, jagrat, the gross body. Then Ramana explains them as follows. The self, which is the lamp, shines of its own accord in the inner chamber, that is, the causal body, that is endowed with nescience as the inner wall. And sleep as the door. When, by the vital principle, as conditioned by time, karma, etc., the sleep door is opened, there occurs a reflection of the self in the egoity mirror that is placed next to the doorstep, the Mahatattva. The egoity mirror thus illuminates the middle chamber, that is, the dream state. And through the windows, which are the five cognitive sense organs, the outer court, that is, the waking state, appears. When, again, by the vital principle as conditioned by time, karma, etc., the sleep door gets shut, the egoity ceases along with waking and dream, and the self alone ever shines. The example just given explains how the self is unmoving, how there is a difference between the self and the egoity, and how the three states of consciousness, the three bodies, etc., appear. So this is very interesting. And I like the way it doesn't appeal to the understanding in the classical scriptures but it makes a graphical representation of what I call the house of the self. What is the house of the self? Well, it's the body, but it's more than just the gross body. It's also the subtle and causal bodies. And it's more than just a waking consciousness. It's also dream consciousness, deep sleep, and Turiya consciousness. So let's pick this apart. <laughs> Try to understand it better. 
The self is unmoving, unchanging, always shining in the state of Turiya. Turiya, you remember, means the fourth. And this is the state of consciousness which has the other three states of consciousness as its objects. In other words, Turiya does not contact the mind and senses directly, but it contacts the other three states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. So, why don't we see this self-light all the time? Because it's surrounded by a wall of ignorance. This is our conditioning. This is our, actually, our karma that we have created by focusing on material objects, material senses, material bodies, etc. So in this wall of ignorance, there's a door, which Ramana calls the sleep door. So what he means by this is that when that door is closed, the inner room is sealed off from the outer chamber and the courtyard. In other words, there is no contact with dreaming or waking consciousness. There are no objects. There is only deep sleep and turiya. And in this state, the self is in its native state. So when by conditioning and karma and so on, the sleep door opens, then the light of the self is reflected in the mirror of the ego, which is next to the doorstep of the Mahatattva. Now, the Mahatattva, if you don't remember, we went through this in detail in the Lakshmi Tantra series. The Mahatattva is the aggregate of all the material elements. You could say it's like the ocean of the universe. Both the subtle and gross elements are included. <clears throat> so besides earth, water, fire, air, and space, there's also mind, intelligence, and false ego, and so on, all the subtle elements there too. So all this comes into play. It's a package deal, as I've explained so many times. As soon as you have material space, akash, you have all the others because they are consequent upon the existence of material space. Dimension leads to time. Time leads to change. Change leads to coming and going. Uh, motion, transformation, birth and death, and so many other things, karma, etc., etc. So this is the Mahatattva. So the reflected light of the self in the mirror of egoity illuminates the outer chamber. The outer chamber is dreams. In dreams, we live in an artificial world, a temporary universe that has different rules from the regular material universe. It's a subtle world and it's built on the mental body. And in that mental body are all our memories, all our impressions, all our desires and fears and so on. So in dreams, any crazy thing can happen. <laughs> It doesn't have to conform to, to physics and chemistry of uh, the ordinary world. But when we look out through those five windows, hearing, sight, smell, taste, and touch, we see another world with many, many objects. And this is called Jagrat. That's what Jagrat means, multiplicity of objects. So when this state is in play. We're looking through the dream world 
out into what most people would call the real world, <laughs> which is just a more persistent dream. And because of that, our dreams, our thoughts, and so on, seem to be overlaid on the physical world, the gross world that we perceive through the senses. That is why when we're in ordinary state of consciousness, jagrat consciousness, we still have dreams, and these are called thoughts. And so we have dreams composed of name and form by which we categorize and classify everything and try to model the reality and predict what's going to happen. And the funny thing about this is, if you've ever actually observed it, <laughs> that most of the time it's wrong. We're not really too bright, you know? <laughs> so... We get it wrong most of the time. Most of the time, the, the reality or the apparent reality of the external world surprises us. And this is because it runs by karma. And unless we include karma in our model and have a really good idea of what it is composed of, we can't accurately model what's happening in the material world. So that's why it's said that the world that we see is not the world that exists. The world that we see is the world overlaid with these mental constructions called vasanas, upadhis, sankara, and so on which are different mental fabrications made of name and form that we create in an effort to understand the world. But we can't understand the world because it's inconceivable. It's beyond human intelligence. So because it is beyond human intelligence, we always get it wrong. <laughs> but we cleverly conceal that fact from ourselves by immediately jumping to the next thought, and the next thought, and the next thought. And this happens with each impression that comes through the senses, which is like thousands of times a minute. So the mind is like a motion picture or a video that consists of thousands of still frames projected in such rapid sequence that they appear to move. This is the world. This is the reality of the world. The world is simply a projection, not of our will, but of a higher will, Ishwar. This is something not shown in this diagram. Ishwar is, is creating the world that we perceive through the senses. And because Ishwara has infinite, for all practical purposes, infinite intelligence, the world that Ishwara creates, Ishwara and Ishwari, Shiva and Shakti, the world they create is beyond our understanding. So we can guess, you know, and especially if we know astrology, Vedic astrology, not Western astrology, which is basically useless, then we can guess right a lot of the time. And we can understand what's happening in the world, or what's happening in our lives anyway, is due to our karma. So in this way, we can begin to meditate in such a way as to reduce the creation of karma to the absolute minimum. And eventually to stop creating karma altogether which is what happens when we are only the self. So in other words, we have to demolish this house piece by piece, take it down, take it apart, and get rid of it. That is the process of meditation. So that's why it's called neti neti, not this, not this. 
because in meditation, we're demolishing the house of the self and setting it free. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.